Hello, everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us on the live stream of this Talk Python to Me podcast recording. So excited to be here with Peter. We're going to kick off the show in just a second, but I do want to let you know if you have questions, comments, thoughts, put them into the chat here in YouTube and we'll try to make them part of the show. With that, you know, thanks for being here. And uh, Peter, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Hey, it's really great to have you here as well. It's been far too long since we've talked containers and Docker and all the things. I was looking back at something like show nine or something like that. It was, I, I believe, 2015. Has anything changed with Docker since 2015? It's, Shame I on you, I suspect something has. I know, I know. I suspect something has. It's got to. <laughs> yeah, there's been a, it's, uh, yeah, containers are interesting. They're moving, moving very fast, right? Very yeah. fast. Uh, on, on just about all fronts, I think the whole developer devops devsecops you know just if have embraced it the past five years Three yeah i was seeing what you might might respond to from that question and it to me it seems like not so much how containers work and run but just how people have embraced them and how many places they show up and how many people are saying hey hey, hey we have a uh, a cluster you just run your thing over here just give us your container and we'll help you run it as part of our platform as a service or whatever it is they're cloud yeah. hosting yeah yeah, it's very interesting, and th and then there's all these little micro. Uh, it may, 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 maybe micro is not the correct term, but the, all these a lot of SaaSes and startups and trying to help and containers at the at the core of a lot of that. Uh, if you get in in a container, we can run it, and uh, yeah, some really interesting SaaSes that are starting up, little niche uh, platforms as a service type things. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's super interesting. Before we dive too deep into that, though, let's let's get what started with your story. What's how do you get into programming? Yeah. So, um, as a kid, I, uh, my dad was, a uh, uh, my dad's an accountant, mm -hmm. um, but a nerd at heart, you know, uh, uh, you know, a techie let's say. And, um, he started out, this is interesting, at least to me, he started out with calculators before, uh, you know, PCs were a big thing. He had calculators and he programmed these calculators and stuff. And, um, Anyways, long story short, he ended up getting that. I think it was Apple II was the first kind of computer we had. And uh, I was fascinated by it, started programming on it, just learning, messing around. Um, fast forward after after high school, I was in the Coast Guard and had gotten out and was going back to school. And, um, you know, I started back as an accountant. My dad said, hey, accounting's a good foundation, You'd like math and science and those type of things. And uh, I hated it hated it the debits and credits and uh <laughs> yeah i was just like micro macro yeah, exactly. now, exactly. now it's very yeah now it's a lot more interesting back then i couldn't stand it but um but then i lucked out my uh my father was running two steel companies and he had a consulting team that that was uh writing software for him you know like very exciting stuff like uh, inventory management yeah, work yeah. And process tracking right you know but um it's not exciting but it's the kind of stuff that if you looked at what people were doing before, it was dreadful, right? It was like transformative, yeah. even though it seemed so boring and basic. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, "Why don't you, um, why don't you come work for me?" And uh, this consulting firm, uh, the main, the owner had um, some life issues or whatever, and and had to move on. And and I said, "Well, I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm doing." He said, "Oh, you'll figure it out. There's a big uh, Barnes and Noble at the top of the hill. There, you can." You got a whole section on it. Just yeah, go read. It. Yeah, literally. Yeah, and uh, and I did, and I did, and you know, it was. Um, I had a passion. I had a burning desire, right, to learn. It was fascinating to me. Um, yeah, and so I switched over a computer science degree, MIS, and uh, but by the time I got farther along in that, I was getting paid to program, and I was learning a ton more on the job. So uh, that kind of your first experience of getting paid to to write code was it just like I can't believe they're actually paying me to do this? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It was um, yeah. I mean, it's literally how they say you know find something you love and are passionate in, and the money will come and. Mm. Yeah, it did. It, it certainly did. I was, I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I was getting paid to learn and write applications. So yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah, fantastic. I remember my first experience like that as well. I'm like, I had better figure this out before they realize I can't actually do this. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I could do the things they wanted, but I'm like, oh, any moment they're just going to say, nope, you actually don't get to do this anymore. Yeah. But it was, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then I, I went, um, by that time I said, you know, I have to get on a bigger team and learn. I know I got to the point where, okay, I can write programs, but I don't know how to be an engineer. Yeah. And I'm not sure I could put it in those type of words, but, um, but luckily after that, I got on a team and, uh, had some great mentors. So yeah, yeah that's, that's how I kind of, kind of got started. 
Yeah, fantastic. I, I think that's good advice. You know, it's it's really cool to be on small teams because you really get to put your hand in so many things areas you're not pigeonholed into well i'm the one who optimizes a stored procedure so i do that <laughs> right you know right. you get like a really broad experience but at some point when it's like i'm there's no one i can talk to or learn from to go farther in this then it it gets to be a little bit limiting i think it, it, yeah exactly I'm like well that, that's how it got for me i was like i i don't know where to go next and i don't know who you know i didn't have anybody there with me yeah i think yeah. i think having a mentor either either um you know, well-structured or kind of loosely structured or whether you look back on it five years and go, oh, that person was kind of a mentor for me. It's, it's very powerful, right? It's very powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it totally is. I, I, I remember making that transition to a really great group of people who were, every one of them I felt like was way smarter than me. And it was intimidating, but absolutely was a good outcome. Yeah, that's the place to be, right? Yeah, yeah. unless you, unless, you know, of course, uh, I think a lot of us too in tech deal with, deal with uh, ego issues sometimes i know i did right like hey i'm i'm pretty smart i know what i'm doing and then you, you when you're young and ambitious right and you run into other really smart people that like <laughs> are smart <laughs> and you go oh, okay i'm not that smart yeah, yeah it's a little yeah. humbling but it can uh, be humbling yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are probably good life lessons but they're hard to take when you're young i remember <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah fantastic so how about now um what are you doing day to day yeah so i head up the developer relations team at docker um, and I get to do what I love. Uh, you know, I still get to play around with tech and learn new things and build stuff, but then I also get to transfer that knowledge to others or at least try. Um, so teaching and mentoring is, um, what I do mostly day to day, write content and workshops and those type of things. Um, yeah. So, and, and I help, I help folks learn to use containers and Docker, um, to help build applications. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love my job. Truly, yeah, do. I, I can imagine, you know, I really have, I've thought for a long time that this developer evangelist sort of role, it just seems so neat because you get to work with a bunch of people. You're not really there just closing boring Jira tickets every day, right? You, you get right. to just work at like the fun level of software and really interact with a lot of different people. You get to go to conferences, maybe be on yeah. a podcast, all those kinds of things. I just, it's a really cool space to be after you've you know, learned yeah. enough in the industry to, to play that role. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I remember seeing, um, I had thought about the role before, but, um, I think I was at, uh, Google's, uh, what is it? Google next? I think it's their conference, but, um, yeah. And I, and that was when I kind of, I had known about dev advocates and DevRel, but when I saw a couple speak, I was like, Oh wait, dev advocates. They, oh, they get paid to do this. This isn't just, <laughs> you know, Peter, who's a software engineer then speaks, right. This is their job. And I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's I think it uh, you got to have the right personality for it, but I think it's really fantastic. I did actually a whole episode, episode 189 on this this role. And I had four or five people who were at different companies doing this. So, yeah, I it was it's, it's really, really neat. So let's you know, I do want to catch up on what is new in, in Docker and containers in that whole space. But there are a lot of people with lots of different backgrounds. Let's you know, listen to the show who I'm sure everyone's heard of Docker and containers, right? It's, it's like hearing of Linux or something, but that doesn't mean you're super familiar with it or you really understand the advantages or maybe the history. So let's actually maybe start with just like the history of containers a little bit. Um, I know yeah. when I first saw the talk by the original, I think it was the original CEO of Docker, gave a really interesting sort of tie back to shipping containers. Yeah. 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 So what's this whole idea of containers? Where's yeah. it come from? Yeah. What's yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, Solomon hikes when, when, um, yeah, that was him. Yeah. When I first saw his, his, uh, I think it was at a pie conference. Now that I think about it actually in Europe. Hmm. Um, yeah, he gave a quick brief kind of like, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? lightning talk? Right. And, uh, it kind of went over at the end and people like went kind of crazy. And I remember kind of seeing it and I was like, and if you ever go watch it, I, I, I recommend people go watch it and kind of look for the aha moment. At least it took me a bit. Right. And, you know, he did ran these commands and then, oh, yeah. And then there's this process running inside of a container and super easy. And um, I forget what he demoed, but it took me a while. Right. To be honest. Right. I stepped yeah. back and was like, well, OK, we have VMs. What is this container thing? And it took me a little bit to figure out like, oh, wow, this is super powerful. But um, 
you know, containers that the, the the constructs to build containers have been around for a while since the seventies, right? And been in Unix, uh, different Unix Unix flavors with change root and those type of things. Um, and then I think uh, around two thousand, I believe, was when um, VServe came out, um, and then sh and then about eight years. So you had Linux VServe and um, FreeBSD had some, uh, you know, container-like functionalities to, to isolate processes into um, those type of things. So vServe was kind of like a virtual, uh, you know, sitting on top of the core kernel and having some virtualization there. Uh, I'll put virtual. Yeah, when I first there. heard about Docker, I thought, oh, this is this amazing new thing. And then as I researched it more, I'm like, actually, this the the pieces had always not always, but they had been there for a while. Like these pieces you're talking about, they just hadn't really been. Sort of put into a nice little package the way Docker yeah. has, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I think that's the beauty of what Docker did, and, and Solomon and his team, right? There was, uh, I think there was three founders, but um, yeah, two is was it 2013? There it is on the screen. Yeah, so 2013, Docker um, kind of took off, right? It kind of exploded, and, and it was just that, and I, you know, they simplified containers. These constructs were all there, but they made it easy. They made it uh, the ability to deep you know, drop back down in into the details or stay very high level and, and use, uh, you know, Docker run, Docker push, you know, the Docker build, right? Those three main commands were super powerful. Um, and I think that was the beauty of Docker. They just made it easier for the average developer or, you know, for if you had to be a Linux kernel developer to kind of really understand containers before that. Yeah. They simplified. Or yeah. Linux admin or, or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's kind of like, um, I think Microsoft did a great job at this. I think Apple's done a great job at this. You know, Microsoft with, um, you know, VB, right? And I'm going to get beat up on internets for this uh, Visual <laughs> Visual Basic. Uh, but Visual Basic six, I mean, kind of weird, but it was a game changer, right? You had C plus plus MFC. You know, we're writing these C plus plus to write desktop apps and business apps, right? And VB6 came along and said, oh, no, no, it's, you know, if you need a text box and some labels and a button, just drag it on there, right? Yeah, look, I won't beat you up for that. VB was transformative. It yeah. was yeah. magical. Yeah. The problem with VB was you could go so far and then you're like, well, VB doesn't do that. So now you now you get a grown up. Now it's time to put your big boy <laughs> pants on and get a grown up language and suffer the, you know, C++ yeah. plus huge gap. But for what you a lot of people built with that, it was... It was incredibly easy. To be honest, there's nothing like that today that I can think of that is so powerful for building a little distributable application I can give to you. Yeah. Electron feels super complicated and hard. Python, you can build stuff, but it's always kind of like, but this is a challenge or that. You know, even the the Windows stuff with WPF is it's way more complicated than like. It yeah. was magic, right? It's just, it's too bad that there's not sort of a semi-modern version of something that simple for people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and if, who knows, if, if Visual Basic had curly braces, may, we might have a different story. Yeah. I mean, like, like, like truly, right? I mean, I, I remember having debates with, yeah, what's well, not a real language? It's, you know, it's basic. It's the basic programming language, right? But yeah, yeah, no. yeah. And John Sheen out there in the live stream says, rad concepts seem to be coming back as these low code, no code platforms. That's a really interesting uh, tie in there. I, yeah. I do agree with that. I think that they've gone even lower than, or simpler than what Visual Basic was to like really, really simple. So yeah, I'm not sure it's exactly equivalent, but it's definitely, you're right. Those things are definitely coming back. Yeah, I, yeah, I think we were real complicated. Now we're going real too simple time. <laughs> the right? pendulum swings hard, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I think we'll find it. I do believe, though, with uh, technology, right, abstractions get higher and higher. And, uh, well, this will kind of roll in a little bit into where the container history went next. And, you know, to 2017, 18-ish, Kubernetes kind of dominated the orchestration, right? Mm -hmm. um, and still does. But it, it is you know, I was going to say horribly, com horribly complex and maybe it is, maybe I'll get beat up for that too, but it is extremely complex, right? Extremely yeah. complex. And I think. And shortly you're mostly talking about like running a Kubernetes cluster is complex, True. not necessarily like somebody's already set up for you and you give them a, you yes. know, a, a definition and say, run that like that part might not be so hard, but like if you're going to do the whole stack, right? Yeah. The whole, the whole stack from the ground up, right? Yeah. It's, it's, 
bunch of moving parts, getting installed, getting everything working together, security, networking. Yeah, it's it's mm. it's not not simple, right? It's not simple at all. But yeah, I, I think it'll get easier and easier and easier and uh, orchestrated runtimes. You know, I see a lot in tech like um, the app engine from Google with Python, right? We're basically serverless now. But when it first came out, you're like, what, you're going to run my whole app? No, 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 no. I need to control all that. Yeah. So we did away with it. But now we're coming back, you know, serverless, we're kind of coming back to it. Same with Kubernetes, right? Oh, your ECS and um, ACI on, uh, you know, hey, give me a container. I'll just run it and manage it. You know, we said, no, 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 no. I need to control all that. And then you get this massive Kubernetes. And now I think we're going back, right? Mm, I, yeah, I just want to give you my containers and run them for me, right? I don't yeah. have time to deal with all this. And Google's an, uh, Google announced um, autopilot and those type of things, right? Um, so I think that's the way we're going to go. And I think Docker as a company, um, about a year ago when we, we sold off the enterprise, a little over a year ago, sold the enterprise business off, got of kind of packaged software, enterprise software, moved more to SaaS, back to development. Yeah, yeah well, let's dig into that for a minute because I remember seeing Docker coming along and it was like, oh, this is really cool. I really cool dev tool, but how are they going to make any money out of this? And I feel like the first big step was, well, what we're going to do is we're going to have special offerings for enterprises and help them, you know, tame their zillions of different types of software they need to run. Right. It sounds like that that's not the case anymore. What's, what's that transition? What's, what's happened with Docker around that? Yeah, I think we were, we were, um, I think first the business model was we shifted to an enterprise business model. Prior to that, Docker was just exploding, right? And building tools and, you know, every Docker con, there was a new release and a new tool. And, you know, a lot of them would fizzle out and stuff like that. Uh, you know, and, and the people with the purse strings, you know, the money said, hey, hey, hold on. You know, this is great. You're doing some wonderful things, but we, we want our money back eventually. <laughs> so can, <laughs> can you go sell something? And uh, yeah, they yeah. Probably, <laughs> open source and Kumbia, we all love it, but like we're investors. Where's yeah. our 10X? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so we shifted a little bit to enterprise and, you know, it was just an old business model, I think, um, you know, on-prem, long licenses, three-year licenses, at least a year, if not three years, you know, you know, and, and then consulting on top of that. So, you know, paying, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars for the software and then, and then twice that for consulting services. It was just a model that's a little bit outdated and, you know, it's still there, of course, but, you know, Salesforce you know, it was really the first that kind of was starting to drive the the nail into the yeah. coffin, so to speak, right? Well, it seems to me where a lot of the those stories are moving are, are you know, are you moving to Azure? Are you moving to AWS? Are you moving to Linode? Like where, instead of trying to solidify and really modernize the data center inside companies, a lot of them are going, how can we just get out of the data center business? In which yeah. case, that's a totally different story, right? In terms yeah. of like how they work with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and we tried, um, we did have an advantage, you know, cross cloud. So, if, you know, yep. um, one single plane of glass for all your containers across clouds, internal, external, but it was just, it was a, a, a day late and a dollar short with funding right, when we kind of mm -hmm. tried to do that. Um, and yeah, so the, so sold off the enterprise business and focused back on what Docker does really well is build development tools, development experiences, making container development first, uh, you know, really easy, right? And that that's yeah. kind of what we're focused on. We call it shift left, right? Focusing back on the developer. We're still very interested in ops and DevOps and DevSecOps, um, but more from a developer's perspective and not that day two long-term running your production environments and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah and, and so we got, got small again, got focused again. Um, you know, we have uh, something like 10 million developers or 10 minute desktop installs, you know, billions of image being images being pulled out of out of hub and kind of looked at it and said, hey, there's a business here, right? Just just official images on hub is a huge, huge asset for us, right? Uh, you know, with Python and packages and all the languages and runtimes, right? Um, to get really good, high quality um scanned packages is hard right and and hub does that so you know where you're getting your mongo database from who's produced it docker kind of puts their stamp on it okay so you guys have like officially verified certified um either direct uh, images or docker files that build the images out there 
Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, official images, which we kind of say, Hey, this is, this is following best practices. This is, um, you know, been scanned for security vulnerabilities. That doesn't mean there's not security vulnerabilities in there. If anybody works in the, in the security space, right. That's, <laughs> it's like impossible, but, um, <laughs> yeah, l l lowers your attack surface. This uh, is the, we're recording this the week that uh, we're basically hearing, you know, 60,000 direct companies have been <laughs> compromised by the Microsoft exchange vulnerability. And then they're probably providing products to others, right? Like it's, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. And, um, <laughs> But at the same time, there's also a lot of news around um, supply chain vulnerability. And the solar winds thing was a supply chain vulnerability. I don't believe the, don't know, but I don't believe the the exchange one was. But you know, Docker is certainly part of that supply chain, either strengthening or or, or weakness there, right? Like we hear about how right. PyPI and NPM and Ruby Gems and all of those have people have been, you know putting renewed interest in trying to get bad things into there. I, I always have the same thought about Docker. If I just grab an arbitrary Docker file off the internet, because, oh, look, this configures the thing that I need, and I, I right. Docker build, Docker run, well, it might be configuring it with extra goodies for someone else right in there, right? And so that sounds like a really good thing to you know at least have you know verified to the degree that you guys can. Yeah, yeah. And it's bringing, it's bring, you know, uh, you used to be with security, right? It's um, I remember sitting at uh, a large computer manufacturing company here in Central Austin, uh, Central Texas. I won't mention their name, but uh, you know we're getting. <laughs> oh, nice! Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're you know launching a big uh, release, and we're all sitting in the go no go meeting, and it's you know a couple of days before release, and uh, of course then that's when the security team walks in, right? And yeah. like, oh, you know, it, it, like literally like dropping down hey you didn't fill out your uh, your tps reports and yeah, exactly you know and well, that's such the wrong time to do it because yeah. you know a lot of those ideas have to be built in yeah. early you gotta yeah it's it's really tricky to layer that on at the very very end 100 percent. and now with containers developers are a lot more uh are closer to the operating system and worrying about it you know be, before you had your vm and you had um you know, you had ops folks taking care yeah. of them, mapping them, keeping Here's it. my code. It's going to need Nginx yep. and MicroWSGI. You figure that out. Go. Right. Yeah. Now we're throwing it in containers and devs are doing a lot of that. So yeah. shifting that security even farther left to, hey, scan your images. Make You should know what's going in your images. Um, you know, what base images you're using. Those type of things are super important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And controlling that whole life, like you said, that that whole life cycle, right? Of of when you're building your images and how through CI/CD, right? Doing the consistency consistently, making sure you're doing scans, right? So you c can protect that whole pipeline. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely need to be thinking about that as an industry. It's it's yeah. it's serious. Yeah, yeah. We and, and it's yeah. There's so many smart people out there, and um, they move fast. They move really fast and keeping up with the hackers is hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. So one of the things I thought it might be fun to touch on is just some of the areas that containers are useful, maybe some of their, their benefits, um, th things like that. Right. Um, I think there's a lot of different use cases that are not, well, it makes DevOps more consistent with development, even though that may be one of the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, the big, the biggest you know, problem that Docker solves is that packaging. It runs on my machine, right? And that's been yeah, part of our marketing yeah. since the beginning. It works for me, right? There's a fantastic thing that people should Google. Maybe if I can find it. I've put it on the show before, but there's a uh, thing called it works, it works on my machine certification. <laughs> you, can, you can get the official certification. This is done by Jeff Atwood and um, some folks. Oh, that's uh, uh, and another guy over there. And so you get this big banner. It says it works on my machine. And the way you get it is you compile your code and getting the latest from any uh, any version control, getting the recent from that is totally optional and up to you. Uh, <laughs> you launch the application that has been compiled. You cause at least one code path to be uh, the to that needs to be checked to be executed. The preferred way to do this is ad hoc manual testing. <laughs> <laughs> you may omit this step if the code change was less than five lines or in the developer's professional opinion, it couldn't possibly <laughs> result there. And then you I check like it that. into source control, right? And so, yeah, I mean, this, that's a joke. And the reason I bring it up is, oh, it's, it's just, you know, so common in the industry that you run into this, this problem, yeah. right? That 
well, we tested over here and under this environment, it works fine, but in a different environment, it doesn't. And yeah. you know, we try to backfill that with things like CI, CD uh, and, and whatnot, but it's, you know, it's still, it's not a perfect fit. So with, yeah. with Docker, you can get much closer to running on exactly the same system. Yeah. Yeah. The idea is not only package your app, but package the operating system, all of its uh, dependencies, your app, its configuration, all the application dependencies, all in one package, right? Into an image um, and then pass, share that around, right? Um, makes it so much easier. Yeah. At, at uh, my, that, that large computer manufacturer, right? We had two huge data centers. And I talk about this in my getting started video, you know, 50 in each center, just, just for the, the browse layer and dub, dub, dub. Um, you know, and if you go through and patching those machines, those 50, and you miss one, and of course we had scripts and all that, but you know, we you still had to manually, you, you know, list of what servers are in and out of the, out of the, uh, data center, who's in DNS, who's not right. Mm -hmm. You miss one. And then you get this, uh, these, these random errors where I hit three good servers, the fourth one breaks, and then you hit F5 and you go back to server two and you're fine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's really tricky when it's, it's going to, you know, could be ro round robin type of uh, exactly. load balancing and you're like, well, sometimes it's wrong, but I don't know when. Right. Right. Yeah. So we used to just go and, you know, restart all the servers <laughs> one by one. Some of, yeah. the, some of the troubleshooting, yeah, because some of the troubleshooting you get into is like, <laughs> we have no idea. Yeah. Uh, so I think Docker really, really attacks that really well. Um, but then when you looking at developers, what I'm really excited is, you know, moving into microservices and kind of more modern cloud first kind of uh, development, right? Again, getting everything running on your machine, uh, you know, 10, 15, 100 microservices, that you're not going to use, you're not going to touch, you don't work on, but they need to be there. So, you know, you have this mesh of microservices or even just three or four of them, right, that work together. Um, you have to have your sign on, you know, your single sign on, blah, 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 all these things. And getting databases and queuing and everything running locally uh, is, is hard, right? If I got to install Mongo and SQL Server locally, yeah. and then maybe projects are using two different versions, right? Um, so now if everything's in containers, and then if you're using Compose, which, you know, I'll, I'll use orchestration lo loosely here, but it orchestrates your containers locally. Right. Because Docker is all well and simple and easy when the goal is I need to fire up this Docker container and I put the thing I want to run at the end. You know, I say Docker run, you know, container something. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. If I want to run multiple things and they've got to discover each other on the network, and they've got to have DNS names and this one has to start before that one. Right. All of a sudden, it's a whole a whole nother level of like manual challenges to do that by hand. So Docker Compose is basically a, a way to write a file that takes a bunch of Docker containers and starts them the right way with the right ports and everything. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Why give, gives you kind of built in uh, discoverability. So DNS, um, you can easily plug in volumes and share volumes across your containers. Yeah, su super powerful. And it's also a way to, um, like you said, writing out all these Docker run commands and then your, you know, your run command is yeah. huge. You could put that all into uh, um, a Compose file. And put then version control. Version control. like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, to, and, and then once I, yeah, exactly, Michael, I could set up and then, uh, you know, setting up a new dev. Hey, you know, uh, pull latest from GitHub and, Docker compose up and right. you know brings your application up. It, yeah, so I, I've I've got a couple of ideas here that I thought might be fun to bounce off you. And the very first one on the list is onboarding new developers. Yeah. Right. I mean it's one yeah. thing to say, well, we're gonna create a new project and we're gonna work on it, but almost no one starts jobs with brand new projects. They start jobs with here's what we've been working on for four years. It's kind of clunky, but it works. <laughs> right. Go. Right. Right. A hundred percent, hundred percent. And I wrote, I wrote a blog post about this, but, and then uh, uh, my mentees, right. A lot of them come out of boot camps, and, you know, they're used to right click new project. Right. And I'm like, that's yeah. not where you're going to go. Right. You're going to jump into a code base that is not the latest and greatest react, you know, functional components, right. You're going to have old stuff and you got to be productive. It's a huge, mm -hmm. I mean, the la I mean, I'm sure the audience will know. It'd be great to hear, you know, how, last time you joined a dev team, how long it took you to just get your computer set up and get your environment mm -hmm. set up, and get familiar, right? It, it's a week, at least a week, if not two weeks. Yeah. Um, or, you know, your machine dies. Yeah. And, and you're like, well, now I got to get it all set up again. I haven't done that for a year and a half. So I forgot how to do that. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm trying to get 
everything into containers as, as much as possible, run everything in containers. Um, when you get into the, the GUI apps, it gets a little fun, but, mm. uh, yeah, if you're running everything in containers, it makes it super simple to be able to move those onboard new devs. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So another one of those that I think we kind of already touched on more or less is reliable development. Like everybody's working literally on the same system and you don't have the, you know, works on my machine certification thing. Yeah. 100%. Another, another one though is, you know, I'm here on my Mac, but maybe I want to do things that are as close as possible to where I deploy my various stuff, things, which is Ubuntu, right? And Mac is kind of like Ubuntu. I mean, it's got sort of a Unix flavor to it, but it's not Ubuntu itself. It's not exactly that, right? And right. so having this ability to be closer to the environment that you're going to run at or you're going to deploy to, even though you happen to be developing it on something that's not that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Be, being able to get correct versions, right. Of, of mm. everything across your stack is, is, is very hard, right? It seems yeah. simple, I, but it's not. I mean, I could get Nginx. I could brew install Nginx under my machine, which I probably have done already, but, <laughs> but maybe I've got like the latest greatest, whereas by default over on Ubuntu, if I just say, you know, apt install Nginx, I think it's held back a little ways for some reason, unless you really like configure it for the latest sources. And so, you know, maybe the configuration file has something new that I could do on my machine that's supported. But if I try to put it out there, it's just going to, you know, service failed to start, go yeah. find a log file somewhere and figure this out. All right. And that's especially when you're new. It's like, I don't even know where the log files are. Why is right. this happening to me? It's so frustrating. Right, right. Or yeah, if um, yeah, you're pulling down a project and the the readme getting started is compile, right? Make, mm. run, make, right? <laughs> yeah, and if, unless you're a C, a Linux C developer, and you start getting errors, you know, off to Stack Overflow you go and start randomly trying things, right? And that, mm. <laughs> as a senior <laughs> developer, you know, I'm like I'm so scared I'm a foobar my machine, right? Because I'm just changing settings and stuff, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's uh. But if you were doing that all inside of your container, and really a Docker file is is the steps you would do to install an application, right? And yeah. so they're all there, repeatable, um, have the correct versions of uh, um, you know libraries all in the image, right? One thing but, to think I, I think is a simple preconception to have is like Docker saves me from knowing Linux in terms of the command. So I don't need to know Linux if I'm going to run on Docker and maybe off to Kubernetes or whatever. And so I can just do Docker and then everything will be fine. But in practice, like those steps you just described, yeah. those are apt install this, <laughs> you right. know, and the various the various um, configuration commands of Linux itself. So there, you do need to know a little bit. There's, yeah. a, there's a very small subset that you need to do, but it, you know, you don't really have to be an admin of Linux. So I, I do think it takes right. down the bar, but I also think it's interesting that it's, you still kind of have to know a little bit about how to set up the system. Yeah, yeah, and it's nice because you can start high level. Like, hey, I just run my my Mongo image and it works, and I'm not exactly sure. Right. I but just when, here's the connection string. We're good. Yeah, here's a connection string, and then if you start, okay, I want to build my own, and I want to get slimmest images as possible. Right. You're gonna you're gonna start diving more in, and really the skill set to build your images is you have to understand Docker, but then you also have to understand Linux commands. Right. How to install things on Linux, configure them. Yeah. For sure. But you don't, to your point, right? You don't have to start there. Like, True. you know, don't, don't become a super, you know, la, uh, uh, admin, you know. Get the, the Linux command line Bible or whatever book right. and like <laughs> start right. tearing through it. I think that's right. a book. Yeah, I think it is too. I, you can go very far with without knowing that. Just basic Linux command. Yeah, yeah. I got a few examples of like, these are the three things you really got to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, there, okay. and there's, a, and the nice thing too about official images that you can they're uh, stored in github too so if you go in the hub and see it you can jump into the github repo and actually read the docker file so it's a great way to kind of kind of learn right of uh, best practices yeah. and the, those type of things yeah yeah absolutely you talked about building like thin thin images and and whatnot so one of the interesting things is taking these docker files and layering them right like instead of just saying i'm gonna well, I, I'm going to need Nginx and I'm going to need Python and I'm going to need all this. So let's just build one that has all that. 
And then any minor change you make to the Docker file means you completely rebuild all of that stuff. And maybe part of that's compiled from source that takes two minutes. And it's like, why is this so slow, right? You right. could make that four or five Docker files that one depends on the other that depends on the other in very like subtle, small ways. So like only the very last bit that changes maybe really requires yeah. much work, right? You want to speak to that a little? Yeah, yeah. So you can do um, two things in there. I think you want to make sure one of the best practices you want to do is only one run one process inside of uh, a container. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I use container and image sometimes interchangeably. So and then I get, I get yelled at for the, yeah. uh, no, I, I'm probably making it wrong. So I meant image, so, I believe. Yeah. You, you, no, and you're totally fine. Right. Cause you can use them interchangeably, but um, so a container is just a running image, right? right. And if you're a computer scientist or, or um, uh, object oriented programmer, you know, it's, it's your class and your objects. So your, your, your class is your image and then your object is your container. So yep. uh, containers are instance of running. And uh, yeah, but I'm, I inter use them interchangeably all the time and I get yelled at in a lot of my talks, but, um, but generally speaking, one, one, one process running inside of your container, you know, it's, it's the, it's the old Linux uh, idea, separation concerns, do one thing, do really well, microservices, those type of things. Mm -hmm. But then um, to be able to create your images as small as possible, right? You can do multi-stage builds is what we call it. So you can have a, a, a stage in your in your uh, Docker file that builds your app that has all your compilers, your libraries, everything you need to, to build in your application. Make that one part of your Docker file. And then below that, you can reference that. And so like a lot of Go Golang stuff, and we do this internally, is we'll use um, Docker to build all our apps, multi-architectural to architect. And then, and then below that, just pull out just pull out the compiled binary and put that in my image. So now your image is extremely small. It only has your executable in it. And everything else that you, uh, the compiler tools, GCC, all that type of stuff is left out. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you do, and so those are kind of like throwaway containers. It'll do everything in container, um, get your nice dev build environment, build it, and then pull only what you need out. So even like in a, in a, um, in a node world where you're not, it's not a compile, compiled language or Python's compiled, not a compiled language, right? You could do everything you need in an earlier stage and then pull that out just what you need into the final stage um, to be able to serve those up in your runtime. That's it. And that's the best way to kind of get the smallest, uh, lightest images you want. And the smaller and lightest, the, you know, uh, you can get them, then they're, they're easier to pass around. They're easier to start. They're faster to start up. Um, and the attack surface from a security perspective is, is very small. Yeah. Less is better there. Less is better. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Some other uh, areas that I think uh, two more that are certainly related, but not exactly the same. I feel like the data science side has a lot to gain from the whole container stuff because so often the environments are multi technology. You know, you might have, oh, we're going to use this library and it depends on Fortran. We'll use this library and it depends on Rust. And then we're going to control that from a Jupyter notebook. And it's, you know, it's different environments make that harder, easier to, to set up. And so I feel like data science has a lot to benefit from here as well. Yeah, I, I think so too. And, and that's not my world day to day for sure. Um, and I gave, so I gave a talk at the Toronto Machine Learning um, Group uh, a while back, the talk should be online. So if you're interested, you would check that out. And it, and when I was step back and really thought about what I wanted to talk about, and how is Docker really helpful in these scenarios? And it's kind of all the things we've been talking about. It's it's how do I share my data set with other data scientists, right? And you can put those in images, and you can put those in volumes and share those, right? And then how do I get a consistent environment to to you know reproducibility is the biggest thing in science right right that's the other half of that that i was hinting at that's right yeah yeah and so having that reproducibility that i can share with other scientists and you have everything packaged together that i was running right and you might swap out the data with your own data but but the processes is all the same so i think reproducibility is huge and uh, talking with those folks the machine learning folks that's what they were looking for right is how do i pass this around how do i share this how do i get my environment up quickly without having to become a, a full-blown computer scientist, right? A, a software engineer. Or an admin or something. Yeah. And admin, yeah. Well, one, one of the challenges, you know, in science in general, I believe lately is there's been, I don't know, what is it, I'm sure you call it a crisis of reproducibility, but like a real focus on reproducibility. And because of that, 
I think some folks have realized certain studies are very hard to reproduce. And it used to be what they would publish is here's a graph I generated with my software. And here's the analysis of the graph. And you're like, well, that could mean anything. I can make a graph out of anything. That doesn't mean right. very much. Right. And so then the move to like Jupyter notebooks and IPython and so on to say, well, here's the code and here's the graph and here's the explanation. And that's a fantastic, but you know, what version of what the library that maybe had a small interior change that no one sees that, that might, per, you know, propagate right. some change down there and you know you can solidify all that stuff right. into a, a docker container and then say this is exactly what we ran at least yeah. maybe it was wrong maybe it was right but this is what we did right yeah yeah just even a minor tick in a version of a um an algorithm that's processing the data right and i'm i'm one tick behind you and well that's not the same right it's not yeah. the same yeah it might be okay but we need to know that that's how the difference is you yeah. know one thing that's interesting I don't, have you seen this project uh, gigantum no i haven't no okay so this one i had these guys on the show back on episode 238 and it's really all about docker it's super interesting oh cool so it's like a collaborative way for building like local environments in docker but then sharing those and then yeah. you can work on them and then you can like publish them to the cloud. And there's like all these cool activity streams. And it's just all about orchestrating uh, data science with by facilitating that by doing Docker. They have interesting things. Like if you go in and open up like a terminal and you type some commands, I believe they try to like capture those and make those part of what has to be done to the Docker container, even though oh, you didn't change the file. So they're, they're trying to do a lot of stuff to make it like really the same. So I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting idea. Oh, that's interesting. I'm going to go check it out. Yeah. Jumping back to our earlier conversation, building that Docker file, right. Is, is, and you, especially when you're learning commands, right. That, that, uh, build debug cycle test cycles mm. can be painful a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah. So we're trying to think about that at Docker, right? Like it's one thing to have an image and just run it and use it. And then it's another to build, build an image, right. A very complex image and kind of, so what you end up doing is kind of what you say, you create a base image and then you're inside of that running commands and then go crap okay what did i run there exactly go write that down <laughs> <laughs> yeah we kind of love to reverse sometimes that thing i just did to make this work make yeah. that part of the docker file you know right. <laughs> just, <Right. laughs> extract what i did uh those five things i typed on the command uh the terminal command prompt when i logged in with docker run you know z shell or bash yeah i need that too yeah yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah advice do you got advice on that i mean it, it, it's basically uh, saving at each point. Right now, it's very low fidelity, right? You're mm -hmm. you're running the command and then and trying to remember, right? And it's painful. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It's very painful. Uh, some, some up arrow action, like okay, uh, yeah. I did that. Then down arrow, down arrow, down. Okay, those are the things. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we've been playing around with some interactive, lightweight kind of. I say editors, but tools, right? To mm. to build your images. So the concept of building an image from scratch, it's where you kind of, you can do a top or a Docker file, say from, you know, Ubuntu or from Alpine. Well, you can do from scratch and that's literally nothing, right? And you're yeah. moving everything in yourself. And that's tough, but it's, it's if you, the, uh, the most secure and the leanest image, that's the way to do it. And yeah, so we've been thinking about tools around that. And it's exactly that, capturing what you're doing and what works, right? So you can, you can play a little bit and take, you know, uh, try and figure things out. And then once you figure it out, you're like, oh crap, what, what was that sequence that just worked? Right. Cause I did five things, but those three things were what actually worked. And that, that could be tough for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I find that what I do is I'll fire it. I'll, I'll try to create the Docker file. It'll invariably fail in some way that I didn't predict. So then I'll get it as far as I can run it in an interactive mode and try to you know, get it to go to where I want it and then go, okay, well, these were the steps. You know, maybe it aired out during the build, but you couldn't figure out why. So you want to go explore something to see what the log generated for that failure. Right. Uh, there's a little bit of back and forth. Yes. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. What Hopefully. do you think about um, <laughs> things like attaching, uh, basically using Docker within some of these tools like PyCharm and VS Code both have these ways to say, just run this, but in Docker when I pressed a bug. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, my old school developer, you know, no fancy uh, editors, right? Text editor, you know, 
it, it dies a little bit inside, but I've had to get over that. Right. I'm like, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like I tell my mentees too. I'm like, okay, when we start, like you're in a text editor, remove all, remove all the tools. Cause you've got to feel the pain to yeah. understand. Yeah, what yeah, sure. But with that said, right. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the tools are fantastic, right? The, the context switching, right? If you can stay right in your ID, your main tool and do everything within there and do it really well is super powerful. Uh, the VS Code uh, plugin is super powerful, right? Of, of managing your containers, running containers, dev containers, mm. connecting into ACI and Azure and, and launching your containers right there um, is it's extremely powerful, yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's going to get to the point where you might be running stuff in Docker, but you don't even know it. Like, yeah. You might conceptually know, but there's nothing about what you do or what you see that makes you feel like, oh, it's running in Docker. You just, I pressed run. It did these things. I saw it in my browser or I saw the output. Yeah. I don't know where that happened, right? But it happened in Docker. Yep, exactly. Yeah, it just works, right? That's that's yeah. where that's where we're trying to go is like with our tools is like you... The more you know, you're, they're, they get out of the way, right? They're not in your way is like maybe the best way to say it. Yeah. Right. Really, really good tools. You kind of, oh, you kind of go, does that really doing a lot for me? And then when you figure out, you're like, oh yeah, it's doing a ton. I just didn't, don't know it. It, do, it does it so well. Right. Right. Exactly. I think we have time for two, two more topics that we can touch on. So you know, we talked about the multi-container stuff and we talked about, you know, run this on my cloud. And I feel like a lot of times what that means these days is Kubernetes, mm -hmm. right? Um, everybody seems to have a hosted Kubernetes offering. Sometimes that means just give us your container. Others, that means, well, we'll really just run the cluster sort of configure it for you, but you kind of got to still own those VMs that run it. Um, yeah. th there's some sort of spectrum there. You know, what are your... What are your thoughts on people working with Kubernetes versus just like directly with Docker itself or yeah. maybe even a pass, like a, almost a serverless type thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think there's a, uh, if you spend a lot of time on the internet, right, we're all on the bleeding edge, right? Yeah, we absolutely lot, are. Yeah. Yeah. You read a lot of blog posts about, um, you know, Kubernetes and service meshes and serverless and, and those are all fantastic and wonderful. Right. But, a lot of us out there are not, um, we're not the Googles or the Netflix or, you know, Disney plus, right? Yeah. You, you can see, I watch a lot of movies, but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so you have small teams, small three, five person teams that really are writing the majority of the software out there. Right. And there's nothing wrong with standing a VM up, putting a Docker engine in it and running your containers like that. Right. It's, that's yeah. the way we started. It's, just, it's extremely powerful to, uh, you know, before I came to Docker, I had a consulting business, a custom dev, and that's how we ran all of our, our containers, right? We had a Docker engine installed on a VM, sometimes two VMs, right, that we managed as the orchestrator. And um, it ran fantastic and we, we could scale, we had load, right? It was, and to update it and to maintain it, all the things we've kind of been talking about today were super simple because they, the only prerequisite for the VM was to have the engine installed. Yeah. And, and to be honest, that's how my stuff is running now. I have a, a CI, CD stuff set up. So I do get pushed to a certain branch. My VMs automatically work with the load balancer. They automatically update themselves. They restart and re like it's, it's hands off. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's a small, small set of us. Like it, it works. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And, and serverless. And then, um, and then also kind of the container, um, uh, passes that are out there. So ECS, um, uh, ACI. So ECS is a uh, el elastic container service from Amazon. ACI is Azure container instances. And I don't know if Google has one. They probably do too. Um, love probably. you, Google. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyways, um, you know, it's being able to take your container and just run it, run it in the cloud and worry about the container running and where it need, what it needs to do and how it needs to run, right? And ECS will take care of the rest underneath the underneath the covers. And that that's a fantastic option. I mean, it's a it's kind of, you know, it's like those progressions, right? If you're doing a, a single VM with the Docker engine or or two of them, a couple of them, and that becomes painful when you need to scale, really look at ECS or ACI, right? Because mm -hmm. that will help yep. you scale a lot easier. And you don't need to be a Kubernetes expert. Um, and then if you do, yeah, then then go to Kubernetes. But I, I always tell people 
and, and Swarm is a great option too. Swarm is an incredible orchestrator. It works. Which, how does that compare to Kubernetes? I, you know, I hear Docker Compose, I hear Swarm, I hear Kubernetes. I'm not sure when I should be thinking about which. Yeah, well, so Compose is fantastic for local development. I would use it primarily there. You can use Compose to deploy in the production, but- Would I use Compose if I had only a single container I wanted to run? But yeah. maybe it had a complicated yes. uh, layering potentially. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So Compose works great there too. Of e even just even if you're running one container and all the command line switches and flags and environment variables and uh, secrets, all those type of things, like put them all in your Compose file. So one, you don't have to write a, remember all of them, and two, you don't write bash bash scripts to just run the Docker command, right? Yeah, you you plug them all in just like that. Uh, you can see your passing ports, setting up volumes, uh, all those type of things, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's super simple. Yes. I, so I would absolutely do that. Um, and then, and then, uh, oh, I forget what we were talking about. <laughs> I was sort of talking about your thoughts on Kubernetes. And then I oh, asked yeah. you <laughs> to compare uh, Swarm, Kubernetes, and Compose. Yeah. Kubernetes is dead to me. That's why I forgot. No, just kidding. I love Kubernetes. Again, I'm going to get beat up. No, I, I, but, you know, when I tell people start, think about swarm right if you're doing a one instance don't jump to like have really good reasons to jump into kubernetes it's super power, powerful it's a it's a great tool it really is but it, it comes with a ton of complexity right yeah so don't need well to there's like i said before there's a difference between i want to run this on kubernetes and i want to have my own kubernetes cluster for which i'm the admin right 100 percent. Right. yeah yeah and don't get stuck in I, also another advice and you know like f some engineers, you're like, don't get focused on developing for your resume, right? You know, a lot, a lot of times, oh, we got to get in Kubernetes. I want to have Kubernetes yeah. and all this, right? And and yeah, you know, you want to le learn new technology and stay cutting edge, but it it that's a tough one. It's that's a tough one to go to. Um, yeah, you can get very far with single engines uh, with Compose and then with um, Swarm. And Swarm is a is a great orchestrator. Uh, it's built into the engine. Um, it is. It moved to the enterprise with Morantis when they bought the Docker Enterprise business. Um, so they maintain it. We got we got out of Docker proper. Has gotten out of the uh, orchestration business, but it's a fantastic orchestrator. It just works. Um, a prior life at Docker, I ran all the customer success technology. So our knowledge base, our search engine, our training uh, um, tools, and everything, and we ran on Compose, uh, Compose, okay. and all on Swarm. Five nine uptime, never touched it. Yeah, Didn't yeah. have to give up the team, right? It just it really works. Um, and then when you when you need things like sidecars and and more complex networking and um, the more complex uh, data storage volumes, those type of things, uh, that's where Kubernetes really shines. Um, but other than that, you know, you, it's, Swarm is fantastic, and single engines is work, will get you very far. Nice. And then like and then like you said, I would go to. Uh, um, EKS or something like that first, right? Have a Kubernetes cluster and 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 manage at the level that you need to manage at, and nothing lower, right? All right, Until makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Chris McDonough, creator, uh, one of the creators of Pyramid framework out there, is in the live stream. Oh. Says uh, Compose kind of fills the same space as Build Out did in Python land for managing one or multiple containers locally. Yeah, awesome. And hello, Chris. Thanks for being here. Hey, Chris. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So the last thing that I want to touch on, uh, the last topic I think we have time to talk about, is the future. Uh, you know, where are things going? Yeah, Docker, right? Like we've seen this move to focusing more on. You said shift to left, more on the developer tools and whatnot. Um, yeah, where are we yeah. going? Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you brought it to roadmap. Thank you. My bosses will be happy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> my uh, my masters. Um, <laughs> Anyways, love you, Matt. But uh, <laughs> so GitHub out there for doc, uh, forward slash Docker forward slash roadmap. Uh, that is our public roadmap. That is our roadmap, right? We work on that roadmap. Uh, we're actually coming out with a blog post with a feature, and that was spawned, came out of the roadmap, right? It was an idea from the community. Um, it's uh, integrating in with with different terminals with Docker uh, desktop, and uh, that came out of the community. And people said, "Hey, I run iTerm." on my Mac and so does 99% of the other, you know, developers on Mac. Uh -huh. we, we want that integrated, our integrated desktop. And so the, the upticks were, were really great. Anyways, we implement it. So, uh, we do, so you'll see Ben, if you're looking at the screen on the right, Ben is, is, uh, 
the best PM I've ever worked with. Uh, seriously, he's fantastic, but he is in there constantly. Um, yeah, so we look at this roadmap. We follow this roadmap. We build off of this roadmap. We don't have a secret shadow internal roadmap, right? And nice. we say, and hey, we've got yeah. different channels for like Windows and Microsoft and the engine and all that stuff, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. And so go through, read through there, put in, um, you know, put in an issue if you have one, if you don't find it. It's where you can interact, add comments, those type of things. Um, yeah, and we, we do use that constantly. But, um, you know, I don't, so we have DockerCon coming up, so I don't want to uh, give any secrets away. But yeah, we have, I would say, look for us in this year. Uh, the past year, we really kind of, uh, solidified the business, right? Really did a lot of things that, that Docker, uh, didn't do early in its early days, right. As a business wise, um, you know, we were shifting around a lot, but focus back on hub and say, Hey, you know, let's tighten up hub. This is yeah. a place where a massive amount of developers come for value. So we tightened it up, put in good features like, uh, lo audit logging and more team features and fixed our plans and seats and how the pricing and how that works. Um, and then started moving towards developer tools. So integrating it with ECS, ACI into the public clouds. You'll see a lot more of that coming. You see a lot more tools around local development, container first development, um, a lot of sharing. So um, be interesting to say, I'm working on a feature. I have a branch and I want to share that with you, Michael. Hey, you know, take a look at this real quick. And now you're in that same scenario, right? I have to check out your branch. If I'm doing everything yeah. on my machine, do I have all the versions correct? Do I have everything right? Well, what if you could just wrap that all up a container and I just share it with you and you fire that container up and you're in a dev environment in it, not just running the container, but, you know, able to see my code and everything and the app running inside the container and interact with it. Right. Yeah, that's cool. So that's that's powerful. Those that things sounds like a little bit like the VS code feature where they have that's like launch this in code off of GitHub. Yeah. And it just like sets up that uh, remote environment. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Launch, launch this for me. And also too, I can notify you, right? So you get in a little desktop notify, hey, you got something shared with you. Um, and you and you launch this in VS Code and it brings it all in for you. Yeah, cool. And, and to your earlier point, you go, oh, if you didn't know you're running containers, you might not know it, right? It's like, oh, I just got this this PR shared with me and I want to check it out, right? And it's <laughs> just the running. run button and it's good, it's running. I push the run button, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so a lot of stuff coming around that. A lot of a lot of more features in in um, for teams and sharing features coming in Hub. Uh, we have scanning and the security scanning in there now. Um, yeah, a lot of interesting. The thing that GitHub added was notifications of security C CVEs and whatnot. Like periodically, I'll log in and I did this class that interacted in a very minor way with an Electron JS app, and it's always like your repository has this critical vulnerability because some random version in a package lock dot JSON right. is, you know, like, so for me, I'm like, I don't really need that, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and just accept it. Cause I just need it to be quiet to me. But yes. in general, those features are super useful when those come up for your actual code. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anything like that you guys are thinking about? Yeah. So we, so we partner with sneak, um, which is a, a, a dev security scanning uh, company, the security company. I shouldn't say just right. scanning because they do a bunch of stuff. But now you have Docker Space Scan, so you can scan your images locally, um, get reports, see high, oh, nice, low severities. Yeah, um, and then that'll run in Hub. So when you push into Hub, your images will be scanned if you have it turned on, and so you have a central place where you can see all those. Um, and then you can use Sneak to to remediate them and and those type of stuff. And Sneak has really good right. tools because where, maybe you um, you scanned even you could have scanned locally push your stuff to production right? and then you haven't touched it for three weeks. But right. in the meantime, something's come out, you need to take action on. Right. And so having it on the hub, giving you notifications, it's, it's constantly running. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, being able to get notified of your base images. Right. So if you run in, um, you know, the note, the note of the Python base, uh, base image, right. When that changes underneath you, right, and there's security vulnerabilities introduced, you want to know, right? Should I go to the next version or not, right? And then I think, too, to your earlier point of, you know, it's like I'm not a security professional, right? So I see these reports and I do a scan and I go, oh, heck, you know, <laughs> 300, you know, high severity vulnerabilities, right? What do I do? And I think what we're trying to do is say, hey, you know, here's here's your here's how you remediate that, right? You're on you're on uh, version 3.2. 
if you bump up to 3.3, it fixes these. So you should do that, right? A little minor version upgrade or major upgrade takes you to, instead of 300, now you have 20 vulnerabilities, right? And they're all medium. So, yeah. You know, I think we need that as engineers to be able to get our job done quicker, writing code, you know, it's a primary function, right? So I got a bunch of these vulnerabilities. And to your point, you kind of like just, yes, just clear these, clear these red X's off of here, right? We might not know exactly what's going on. So really trying to help you uh, remediate those vulnerabilities, but also understand why and what you're doing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really valuable. I mean, if we got it for our code, we should have it for our, basically our infrastructure. Um, comment from the live stream. Um, could Docker potentially be able to share really big files across the globe, allowing others to read code easily? How would this work? Um, honestly, I don't know. I mean, it certainly will allow you to share files as images, and it will definitely allow you to have environments set up like data science environments that could you know, analyze those. But uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think we could do some of that now. So, I'm, you know, through through Hub, being able to just Docker push and Docker pull is very powerful, right? Um, you can get a whole disk image, let's say. Right, because right? instead of getting just the Docker file you got to build, you get the result, which could have had files copied in locally and all set up in the file system internally, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so two ways to share with the, with just the Docker file and say, hey, build this yourself, or I've built it, here you go, right? Mm. Yeah, but I, I would love to hear, um, you know, reach reach out to me uh, on Twitter or something, right? And, and let me know, I'd love to hear more of what you're trying to do, and because that sounds interesting, right? Yeah. Band, bandwidth is interesting too around the world, right? So, you know, I sit here in, in Austin where, you know, high speed internet. Well, really, the, the rest of the world doesn't have that, right? So, low bandwidth. And, you know, of course, I got a screaming, you know, desktop, laptop, right? That I use in fast. And not, not you know, the whole world doesn't have those advantages. So, um, you know, and if I'm pulling down a Mongo, some image, right? And I'm picking on Mongo all the time. But, you know, if it's, if it's over a gig, that's, that's big, right? That, It'll take a while on some network, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. With all the video and uh, video courses and audio processing and file exchange, I've had to buy unlimited data from Comcast because I was going over my one point two terabyte per month data caps every month. It was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot, a lot of data these days. Um, all right, well. You know, fantastic stuff you guys have coming up there. I guess maybe we should uh, probably wrap it up just for the sake of time. But yeah, you know, um, I guess we'll we'll hit the the two final questions I always ask. Um, first of all, notable PyPI package. This is like something interesting that you ran across, and maybe you wanted to share with people that find useful some Python library. Yeah, and because I I love testing, so test containers dot python if if uh and that's a little inside joke that no one on here really knows but i have i have developer friends so i will one of my favorite things to argue against is testing uh just as a thought experiment but it's it's really fun right but anyways but um don't listen to me testing is super important right and being able to test in containers and and pick off these pre-built containers and use right in your in your app right in your code is super powerful extremely powerful so definitely interested in test containers um yeah, yeah, it's super cool. It lets you basically create a with block that says with MySQL container as MySQL or with my MongoDB and DB container as that. And it just fires up a Docker container. You do your tests within that thing. You know, maybe use a PyTest fixture to preload the test data, then run your code against it. So instead of mocking out the database and mocking out Redis, you just run a test Redis and then throw it away, right. which I think that's fantastic. It, it's like yeah. hybrid between integration tests and unit tests, isolation type stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it go, goes back to our earlier conversations around uh, reproducibility, right? Repro uh, yeah, having same environments are very important, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then final question, if you're going to write some code, what editor do you, do you use these days? And now, if you if we would have asked me that about two years ago, it would have been Sublime. Okay. In a plain text editor, you know, back and forth, alt tabbing back and forth between my terminal. Um, but now I, I fall, I've fallen in love with VS code. Yeah. Uh, it's extremely yeah. powerful. So I, I feel like sublime, uh, like so many of the people who love sublime have just naturally moved to VS code. I mean, sublime was really cool. It just had all these like weird community stuff. Like there was uh, sublime and then sublime three, and there was like yeah. permanently in beta and like, are these getting updated? Which one is like the real thing? It's just, it was yeah. always kind of a little unclear where it was going. And then, you know, VS code 
came along with a similar model and just said, well, why don't we put a hundred people just like constantly adding features yeah. to this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know what the number is, but it's high. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that because I, I was a long time supply uh, sublime. I bought it, right? I purchased it forever. And yeah, it was like two or three and I have a theme over here, but it doesn't work in three. And how do you get yeah. it? It was just weird. And then VS code just kind of snuck in and I said, yeah, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. And now I keep just using, I used it as a text editor back then, right? And now I just keep using more and more features, plugins. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. the ecosystem around that is so powerful. Yeah, there's neat stuff, and especially there's a lot of neat Docker things going on in it. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, I'm going to run my VS Code in a Docker and then run con you know, dev containers in. It, uh, <laughs> it'll be like Inception. It'll be Docker, yeah, little Inception, Docker VS yeah. Code all the way down. <laughs> all right. Uh, let, uh, you got a moment for a couple more audience questions before we wrap it up? Absolutely. You know right. me, I, I'll chat away for days, but I know your audience <laughs> might get bored. <laughs> All right. So Brian Sands out there. Uh, hey, Brian says, do you know of any good examples using Docker Compose with Postgres for persistent local storage? I have a hard time finding up-to-date working info to do this properly. Yeah. Check out Awesome Compose. So it's a GitHub repo. Uh, Docker owns it. Um, so awesome-compose. Awesome I can't remember if it is under the Docker organization or not. But um, there's a ton of, yeah, right there. There's a, there's a ton of um, different kind of configurations with different wow, stacks. Super interesting. I had no yeah. idea about this. Yeah, we're trying. Brian. To, yeah, yeah, thank you, Brian. <laughs> I paid him. I'll send you that. I'll Venmo you here in a minute. Um, no, but uh, yeah, check that out. There's, uh, if you can't get your specific stack, you're going to get something very close, right? Um, so you get, there's Flask in there. There's, um, there's Nginx like Flask and Postgres. Uh, di different kind of three-tiered st uh, stacks. And then within that, you'll have Docker files, and then you'll have a, uh, a Compose file to kind of bring it all together. Um, and you should get some really great examples in there. If not, please do hit me up on Twitter, and, and I'll get you pointed in the right direction for sure. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. And then uh, Tinel asks, what is the current state of Windows-based Docker containers? I know there's Nano server. Yeah, uh, you know, I got to tread lightly on this one. Uh, you know, I was super excited when Microsoft, when we, we started supporting and then um, for Windows containers, um, you know, the, the focus has been not, not as much, you know, the, the, the amount of people actually using Windows containers is very, very small compared to Unix based containers. Um, so, you know, just, just because of that, the focus has not been on that, um, but we're still, we're, there's still a thing. They're still being developed on, um, just not they're just not as prominent in the industry for whatever reason especially yeah, with well you know where i would say they probably as is stand with microsoft these days their their focus seems to be if it runs on azure yeah we love it right this is where we we will sacrifice many many of the things so that it will run on azure yep and a lot of that i believe is check this thing in windows and like say visual studio code so i can push deploy to run on docker on azure Yep. I think yep. that's probably where a lot of it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and WSL two, um, is huge, right? So talking yeah. to the Microsoft folks, right. They want to be the place where you come. The windows platform is the place you come for developing, right? So whether you're a windows developer or a Linux developer, right. You're using VS code, you're running on windows, you're using WSL two for Unix development, or you're using windows for windows development, right. That's, that's their thought, right? So, the underlying platforms kind of change, and with containers, they can do some of that. So, they're focusing a lot on WSL two, which is which is super powerful, yeah. right? Which really just means make WSL two good, so then it runs on Ubuntu, <laughs> or something like that, right? I mean, we just leverage the Ubuntu Docker support, I suspect. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, while we're talking platforms, I've been doing basically nothing but M one stuff these days. Since mid December, I, I thought I would, you know, I got my Mac Mini. Yeah, M1, and I thought I'd be juggling. This would work here, that would work there, and I just literally have just turned off my laptop and just do this. And I love it. Uh, what's the story of Docker and M1? Yeah, so we love Apple. It was nice to see our little. Uh, the, I don't know if you saw an Apple's keynote. You know, where you saw the Docker desktop on there, um, which was super cool. But um, yeah, we're we're getting very very close to shipping. Um, you know, a release. Uh, uh, okay. uh, a, a GA. Yeah. Um, I mean, really close. I don't want to give a date or anything, but really, but, you know, tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow like, be okay. We'll do that. <laughs> I'll take it. But very, very, very close. They're working on it. Uh, it's one of our primary um, feature sets to to finish to get done right. The and again, it came from the community. It was our number one 
issue, right? When the, when the M ones drop, you know, I think everybody jumped into our GitHub yeah. issue that we need support. I think the M one stuff has come out way stronger than I expected. I thought, oh, that'll be kind of a neat, who knows what they're doing. But like, you know, as it came out, it's like, wow, this is really transformative in some ways. Yeah. And you can, you can get a, you can get the tech preview. It's pretty stable right now. Um, you know, we, it's just going to be on probably, you know, one off little issues on your environment, how you run containers and, and, uh, what, what exactly what container, you know, because they got to be compiled for the different, la different, uh, it's got to um, basically be an arm image. Yeah. 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 And sometimes you run arm, but then, you know, Mongo doesn't have an arm version mm -hmm. yet. So you're running it in emulation and, you know, so there's those type of things. Um, but we're, we're very, very close to releasing GA. Stay tuned next couple of weeks, I would say. Yeah, fantastic. And shout out to the MongoDB people. Where's your M1 version? Come on. All right. Final yeah. question. We're going to wrap it up. <laughs> now, uh, Ricardo uh, says, now working on Docker feels like it's easier with LXC, one of the other container styles. Am I doing something wrong? I'm interested in giving a container its own IP address. Uh, Peter, this is you. I have no idea. Yeah, uh, Ricardo. I thought I was going to get out of here without any networking questions. Uh, <laughs> but Ricardo, you are not alone. Networking in, in containers is, is difficult, right? Uh, you got to deal with with different uh, different networking technologies, even locally. So yeah, it, so it's very it's it's uh, it's not easy. Um, Is this easier in something like Swarm or Kubernetes or something else that maybe controls it more? No, it gets even no. more complicated. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, once you step outside of uh, when you have if if you have cloud native apps right now, and I'm not a huge fan of that term because what the heck does that mean? But that means right, I want to permanently pay to run my app forever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so if you're in microservices, you're not, you know, you're you're using configuration in, in um, you know, outside of your app to control your app, right? Is the best. But I, I see a lot of legacy apps. I'll do legacy in double quotes also, right? Because just meaning not more microservice type apps, right? Um, and so you're trying to run those apps inside of containers and they have, uh, they have unique networking needs, unique volume needs, right? They're still writing the disk and reading from disk and you can't control that without changing code or they have IP addresses or, or subnets kind of hardwired in, right? And you can't do a lot of that. So you got to configure your networking around your app with inside a container and that's where the complexity comes in. Um, so, you know, give, like, so in this scenario, giving your, giving your container its own IP address, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little bit about against best practices, right? So containers are, should be ephemeral. They should go away, right? You should think of them. And I got to get a better analogy. My apologies to anybody if this offends you, but, um, you know, we think of our, uh, we used to think of our VMs as, as pets, right? And we take care of them, keep them up and love them, love them and, you know, hope they live forever, right? configure them. And then now you have containers, which are more like, um, let's say I, I used to say cattle, but I'm more that offends people. So, <laughs> so, uh, let's say consumable foods, right. And, you know, like you get fungible the, elements. Yeah. Fun, yeah. So, you get, <laughs> so they're more like uh, cake, right. If I get cake in my house, I'm eating that. Right. And it's gone. And then if I want new cake, I got to put new cake. Right. Yeah. So it bad. you don't try to rehabilitate it. You just get new cake. Right, right. Yeah, but you don't eat half the cake and then and then bake, you know, and put another bake the half. The, this is that analogy is going poor. But. Sp speak for yourself. We, we <laughs> refill our cake. We don't ever want to go down to zero <laughs> cake. Right, but that's the idea. So if you're assigning an IP to a container, that container goes away, right? And the idea is if I'm orchestrating that I have multiple containers all running, they shouldn't have the same IP, right? And if one goes away, one comes back up, you don't want to, you know, so th those are the type of things you're getting into. And Ricardo, you're probably shaking your head going, yes, but, 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 and I told totally, <laughs> I need it. <laughs> yeah. I to totally understand. And you can do it, but it's just a little more complex. Yeah. A little hard to answer on, on, you know, with a couple of minutes here, but yeah. I hit you up on Twitter. All right. Yeah. So, um, thank you so much for being here, Peter. This is super interesting. Final call to action. People want to get uh, started, maybe making Docker more of their life. What do they do? Yeah, de definitely go uh, hit me up on Twitter. Say hello. Love to love to talk to folks. Uh, join our community. Uh, jump into community Slack if your uh, questions like that. Ricardo, the community is there. They they will be very very helpful. Um, a lot of our engineers, our developers are in there. All of our PMs are in there. A ton of captains are in there. Docker captains are in there, um, and they're very very helpful. So th this is a great way to get plugged in in the community. Um, and then the, the last thing is DockerCon is coming up here in May. Sign up for DockerCon. Um, it's going to be an online live event. Uh, last year we had 80,000 registrants, um, a really, really big show. So you're not going to want to miss a great content coming. Uh, you get to see more of my smiley face 
Um, and then, uh, and then CFP is still open. We're getting ready to close it on the 15th. So, uh, if you ever thought about giving a talk, right, please submit. If you're a first time speaker, don't let that deter you, right? DockerCon is traditionally a pretty big conference and well attended, right? And it might, it might, uh, you know, first time speakers might not submit. Please do. Uh, we do read all of them and we do take into account, you know, what you've done in the past, but we also do look for new speakers, right? A hundred percent. Um, so don't, don't let that, uh, deter you for sure. All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks for taking the time, Peter. It's been great to chat with you about this. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. You, you bet. See you later. All right. Bye. Thanks everyone for joining the live stream. We will see you on the flip side. See you next time.